Hey, Hillside, how's it going? All right. Man, good to see a full house again. So, uh, my name is Pastor Bill. If you uh, haven't met me before, I'm the uh, pastor of a little bit of everything. <laughs> and, um, and um, yeah, it's great to be here and get the chance to share on uh, Sunday. Uh, normally Thursday is my night. But, uh, hey, um, we're going to do this today. So, um, it was probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. I was working on a, a message. It was a Saturday. And uh, I don't know where Cat was, but Patrick was there and his, uh, his little buddy Sam. They were about 10 or so. And um, they came inside and wanted to know if they could cut down this tree that was growing up in the back of our shed. It was a little sweet gum tree, and I don't know, it was probably not that big around. And I was like, well, yeah, man, go ahead and take it down. And um, so the message was on wisdom. And... <laughs> And as I was working through it, I was like, you know what? That was a stupid thing to do. <laughs> and so I got up and, and I went out back there. And um, they had my guide paddle that I had just bought. It was for whitewater. It was long and, and thick. And unlike a lot of the other guys who bought these carbon fiber paddles, uh, when and not if, but when I flipped the raft, um, <laughs> I don't want to spend $300 uh, on be worried about that for a paddle because I'm a, all about self preservation at that point, right? <laughs> Under the water. Um, but it was thick. You could pry the raft off rocks, but it was nice. So I went out there, and there was my paddle. I don't know where they were at, but it was laying by the tree, and it had a big chunk taken out of it. They had broken it. And when I finally found myself, man, what, what did you do to my paddle? And it, the axe was too heavy. And <laughs> so they were trying to use this paddle to, to take the tree down, and, and they broke it. They weren't using it for its intended purpose. As tough as it was, it wasn't an axe. Um, they used it for something else entirely. And what I want to talk about today is church. Um, it's not what it was meant to be. How do we change that? And what's that look like? So if you got your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to John 5. And we're going to look at verses 2 through 9. Now, I'm going to read from New King James Version, because that's just my favorite one. So, uh, follow along with me in whatever version you have. John 5, 2 through 9. Waiting for the pages to stop flipping. All right, now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time to the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your mat and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord, I give you thanks for this word. Lord, I can't do this justice, but you can. You wrote it, Lord. Um, you gave it to us. Help us to treasure it as a gift that it is. Holy Spirit, we invite you in here. Fill this place. Open our minds, our hearts, our ears, so that we can hear what you have to say to the church. And as always, Lord, I, I pray not to give a good message here today, Lord but a message that does some good for your church, for your people, Lord, for the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? All right, let's get to work. So it's called Bethesda, and uh, it's a Hebrew word, uh, Bethesda, and um, they get that hock in there, you know, and, and it, means, it means house of grace or house of mercy. Oddly enough, uh, the word Kesda in, in Hebrew can also mean 
disgrace or shame. But it was right next to the temple. I mean, really, right at the back door. And it started out as one pool, um, early, way before Christ came, um, that was used to collect rainwater. And uh, they would use it because it was right by the sheep gate to wash the sheep. And, um, and the priest discovered, hey, uh, man, this water is cool. They, they had inadvertently tapped into an underground spring. And so um, the water was fresh and cool, and, and the level rose and fell uh, because of the feeding of the spring. And then as the water went down, the spring, you know, the pressure in that went down. And so um, they liked it so much that they built a lower pool. And they started using it extensively. And then, because it was hot out there, um, they built colonnades around it, or porches, five porches. There was one on each side of the rectangle, and then between the lower wall, there was one across there, so there was five. And it represented to them uh, the five books of the Torah, the five books of the law um, that, that they loved. And, and i got to think, right, have you ever worked at, like, um, a hot barbecue pit all day? Yeah, or no, maybe. Hey, Tom, I know you have. That had to be a hallelujah moment. Then these guys that were, that were throwing the, the sacrifices on the, on the offering uh, altar to be burned, man, after all day of doing that, I, that they're right. <laughs> I'll be in that pool. Right? I mean, it, it was cool. It was nice. And it was lavish. It was marble, and the colonnades had, had red uh, terracotta roofs on them. It was beautiful. But then something happened. Um, the spring started flowing less and less. The water would rise and fall and rise and fall. It was living water. Jesus just got done talking about this in, in uh, chapter 4. It was always preferred to have living water over dead water. Dead water was, was water that was pooled up and, and just stayed there. And so you can imagine what happened in this pool. No wind could get to it because of the colonnades. Very little sun. It was hot. Stuff started growing in here. This once beautiful pool um, became a, a smelly pit. And the priests and the Levites abandoned it. And the sick and, and the lame kind of took residence there. Um, so I want to look at some of the words that, that were used here because I want you to get the real picture of, of what was happening here. Um, it says that there lay many sick. The word lay is kami, and what it, what it means is lay, yeah, but it's the word that you would use for stacking cordwood. All right? It, so that not only were they sick people, but they were stacked there. They, they were piled there. Um, and, and not just that, because then it, it backs it up with, with the word uh, kulas aklas. Aklas means crowd, which would have been sufficient, but a great crowd piled up. You had the, the, the stench of humanity here and the stench of the pool. Um, it said that they were sick people. The word is, is astonaos, and, and it means sick because of a purpose. Uh, There's some reason why they were sick. And it also means sick to the point of incapacitated. These weren't people with a cold. These people were incapacitated. Um, it said the blind were there. It gives them a little bit of detail. A word for blind is, is too close. And it means having no sight. It's a word used for somebody whose eyes have been gouged out. They didn't need glasses. They couldn't see. They had no eyes to see. It said the lame were there. This is a word used for somebody missing a limb, somebody who's been maimed. The paralyzed were there. Paralukos means being withered to the point of atrophy. Um, they couldn't move. And their bodies because he hadn't moved for so long, had become withered. And it says that they were waiting. They were waiting for something to happen, for some miracle, for the stirring of the water. And, and, and it kind of happened like this. Um, because I'm a pastor of, of a little bit of everything, I've done a little bit of everything, and uh, I worked on, on a drill rig for a time, and we would test soil. And... Um, Mike was in the cab of the truck, and, and I was back at the back of the rig, and we were running the, the drill down, um, the auger, and we were about, I don't know, 40 or 50 feet, which incidentally is uh, how deep this pool was. I had to speak of thought, and I heard this, I thought we hit a gas line or something. I don't know, because at first I thought it might have been a hydraulic, but the air was coming out of the top of the auger, 
And I was like, Mike, Mike, we hear something. And Mike said, oh, no, 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 man, that's just a, a spring. Water will come out soon. And, and Brad's like, he said the word come. Water starts spraying out the top. That's no big deal. We hear them quite a bit. All right. I, I've never seen it before. But So what would happen here was, was first you'd see the bubbles, right, because the spring had dried up and, and air had filled where water was once, once was. And then the water would come. So you knew when the water was troubled or when the angel stirred the water, because first the bubbles would come up. And then all of a sudden, the, the um, level of the pool would rise up, and it became turbulent in there. And wow, there, there was no mistaking. And, and there is some evidence that people got healed there. And we know this because Hadrian, uh, the general who rebuilt Jerusalem after his sack, uh, he built a temple to Asclepius there, the Roman god of healing. Because of the, the things he'd heard about this pool, and, and the things that happened there. Um, but what struck me is, is this. If you are incapacitated, right? If you are so sick that, that you have a problem um, getting up and getting around, how do you even get in the pool? I mean, think about it. If you're blind, you, you can't see it. Um how do you get in there? It seems that the people that got healed there were the people that needed the least because they could get around. So just like the water that came in there and stagnated um, and died, just like the sheep that initially came there got cleaned and then died, so was this man. You could tell by, by his answer. He had stagnated there. He had been there so long. And, and he was really waiting to die. It wasn't what it was intended to be. You know, when I Googled House of Mercy, um, I started panning down the hits just to, I don't know, I like to see what other people are saying, think, you know. And there are so many churches with the name House of Mercy, House of Grace. And, and it seems like I don't know, a decent name for a church. Um, and I just can't help but think of the church when I see this. Uh, we all have known, or maybe you have an Uncle Cletus. Um, but Uncle Cletus, is, he's the fun uncle, right? He's the one when he comes to the house, oh, Uncle Cletus, and all the kids start jumping up and down. He's fun, he's loud, he's boisterous, he's obnoxious. But you love him. And then Uncle Cletus found the Lord, and he all but died. He's in church every Sunday. He's there for Bible study. But there is no life outside of, of, of that. And for all intents and purposes, to the outside world, that's what the church has become. It's easy to see where, where House of Shame, House of Disgrace kind of came into play. Because, look, that, that, that's what we were called to be. Jesus said that I have come, that they may have life, and have it in abundance. Jesus said that if anybody believes in me, fountains of living water shall flow from within. And, and not just for them, but for those around them. Living water, fresh water. The early church, man, they got this. Because in, in Thessalonica, Christians got the highest compliment ever by their enemies. They said, oh, these people that have turned the world upside down have also come here. Look, we are meant to change the world. That's the church's job. Man, not, a, not come here and wait to die, hoping that you see some sort of miracle. That's what was happening there. It sounds like what happens in a lot of churches. It's tough. We stay in a bubble. We're called to take this good news to the ends of the earth. But the fact is, most of the time, we don't take it to our neighbors. We don't take it to work. Maybe you're a rebel, right? You invited someone to church. But let's be honest. Why would they come if your morals are the same as theirs? There's nothing different there. Why would they come if they don't know your story? What God delivered you from. 
why would they come if outside of work or your social circle or wherever you, you see them at, you spend absolutely no time with them. So, it's tough to change this. And I know this is the story of a lot of us here. We have to take steps. What's your next step? Well, we'll go by what Jesus said. What he said to this man here. First he said, Rise. And all these people in this pool, right? He was there the, probably the longest, but he picked him. Why? Because he'd be an example. 38 years. So he goes up to him and he says, Rise. Rise up. Um, what strikes me about this is that, like we've already discussed, these people were laying there like cordwood. They were stacked in piles. And suddenly, one of the pieces of cordwood stood up. He stood out from everybody else that was there around the pool. Um, he literally stood out. See, he was now set apart from them. He was standing, and they were laying. He was now different. You know the most common word for, for Christians in the, um, in the New Testament? It's the word hagioi. Hagioi comes from the word hagios, which means to be set apart, to be different. It's used of God because God is set apart and different than any other being that's ever walked this earth. It's set of the temple because the temple is set apart and different than any other building on this earth. And it said that about Christians because we are supposed to be set apart and different than, than the rest of the world and the rest of the people. Look, God wants you to stand out. He wants you to rise up. Man, that's His Word. Look, a lot of times, right, that, that construction world can be like the, the Moss Eisley spaceport in the first Star Wars. Now, if you remember the movie, uh, Obi-Wan and Luke are, are on this little ridge and they're looking over and, and down below is a Moss Eisley spaceport. And Obi-Wan says to Ben, Oh, Moss Eisley, you'll never see a greater hive of scum and villainy. Right? And this isn't true for all construction workers, but, man, I worked it for 20 years. There's a lot of it there. All right? And that's just the world I came out of. Um, so, um, Kat and I joined the church. And one of the people that was on the board, because when we joined the church there, um, we shook hands with the board afterwards, was a guy named Scott. Scott was a painter. He painted houses and had a crew. And I was like, oh, this is great, you know? And, and so, I don't know, a few days later, um, I saw Scott at a, I think he's at the, a paint store, a lumber yard. But um, he said, hey, you know, where are you guys working at? I said, oh, we just finished the project down in Rehoboth. That's, that's the beach. Uh, I hear you working there. He said, oh, man, did y'all go to Hooters? I was like, no. You know, I so, oh, man, we went there last week, and, and, and it went on to tell me this story. And I'm not going to share it here because it's disgusting. But it was about this interaction that he and his crew had with one of the waitresses there. And um, I left there thinking, dang, it's not the worst thing I've heard from a person, right? But it is the worst thing I ever heard from somebody who's supposed to be an elder at the church. He was no different than that crew that he worked with. Same morals, same values. He didn't rise up. He was an elder of the church, but he wasn't clean. Look, the, the first purpose of this pool, right, of, of Bethesda, was to clean the sheep for sacrifice. Look, we're called both sheep and a sacrifice in the New Testament. We're supposed to be a living sacrifice. We're supposed to, to heed the words of, of, of the shepherd who is Jesus. And, and I know that there's a lot of us here that need to be clean. We need to be pure. So what's our next spiritual step there? Man, get in a small group. If you're not now, if, if you know this about yourself, man, find one. We're going to have some more opening up real soon. I'll leave one. Hit, hit me up. Maybe you're a man and, and, and you want some one-on-one -on -one time. I mentor people. Hit me up. Right? If you're a gal, 
we got gals too. I can find you somebody. But let's not walk around this place dirty. That purity is the hallmark of somebody who claims to know Christ. Right? We're different. We rise up from the scum. Jesus didn't pull us out of the muck and the mire so we can climb back in there. Yeah, I know that there's others here that they've gone with that flow being no different than the people they work with, their neighbors, for years. And you're thinking, I can't stand now. They know too much about me. I've already shown a bad example. Look, this guy waited 38 years, but Jesus empowered him to stand, and he will do the same thing with you. Look, he didn't get whole until he stood. Immediately he was made whole, but he still had to stand. And so do we. And look, when you do, people want to know more. Look, so look what it says. Uh, it says, he told him, take up your mat. Take up your mat. Why did Jesus say that? Right now, in the book of John, uh, in particular, every miracle and um, every I am statement has two meanings. It has our common sense meaning, uh, meaning if you want to hear that, come Thursday, because I hit you with that. But there's a spiritual meaning of it, too, and that's what we're talking about today. Pick up your mat. Um, as, what is this mat symbolic of? And why do you tell them to pick it up? Um, I mean, uh, it's a mat. It's not a bed. It's a mat of probably two thin layers of some sort of fabric with some straw in there or something. It wasn't like he was going to take it home and sleep on it. All right? It was, it was dirty. It smelled like urine at the best case. All right? It, it was nasty. It was stained up. But Jesus said, pick it up after he stood. Couldn't he have like, left it for somebody else to use? Or he could have done the Christian thing and, and brought it to the goodwill because you're too cheap to pay the dump fee. Um, I digress. I didn't talk about how you blessed somebody with this mat. No, I, why didn't you make it a, a B, B line for the trash with this mat, you know? What is the purpose? What's the symbolic of? The mat was symbolic of his testimony. Take that mat with you. Let people see it, because people did see it. They got in trouble for it, but hey, man, if you're going to walk this walk, people are going to give you some crap. All right, but, but God is going to give you praise and say, well done, good and faithful servant. He said, take it with you. Um, and look, um, it was his testimony. It seems cool like it's a reminder of where he was, but it wasn't a reminder for him. It was a testimony for others. Look, anyone who would carry that nasty, smelly mat around had to have a story about it. Think about it. If you've seen it, you'd, you'd want to know, right? I don't know how many times I drove by that sign that says, Brandon, home of Iowa's largest frying pan. And finally, I was going to South Dakota one time. I said, I got to stop there. As y'all know, when I travel big, I like to meander. You know, um, I want to see stuff. And so I went there. I had another story behind that. And it turns out, if you've never been there, it's a humongous frying pan. It was built for, I think, a 2004 um, men's breakfast. It would fry 88 pounds of bacon. I can't lie to you, I wanted that frying pan. Um, but I didn't have anything to cook with. I could redneck something to make that thing work. I know I could, right? Um, I wanted to take it with me, um, but I couldn't. People can take Jesus with them, right? If you give them your testimony, you got to get their interest first. Look, the mat was his testimony, and it was powerful. It says in the book of Revelation, they overcame him, Satan, by the, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Share your testimony with others. It's powerful. It helps others. Pick up your mat. Take it, where you, take it to work. Take it to your neighbor's house. They ain't got to lay on it. You just got to tell them about it. I read a story about this guy named Julie. And um, it wasn't written by Julie. It was written by somebody else. She was at the doctor's office. And there was another gal sitting there in the waiting room. 
And she looked over, and, and the gal was wearing a, a sleeveless top. But her arms were nothing but scar tissue. And, um, and she asked her, she kind of struck up a conversation, well, do you mind asking, what, what happened to your arm? And she went through her story about being perped on it as a child and the, the self-doubt and the self-hatred she had for herself and how it led to cutting. Her arms were scar tissue from cutting. And the woman said, well, why wouldn't you cover that up? And she said, these are my victory scars. Because <laughs> that was then, and this is now. And I let them show because there's other people who are just as hurt, just as sick as I was, and they need this hope that I have. She shared her testimony, and it was because of, of something bad. Her mat was on her arms. Where's your mat? Mm. It makes you stronger. It makes other people stronger. And yet, I know that there's people here today who feel like, well, they've never really overcome something that they feel is worthy. Oh, beloved, don't think that. We have all overcome something, and if you haven't, you ain't a Christian. Right? He didn't come for the, for the righteous. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. So maybe if you can't overcome that, your next step would be to serve. Look, the invalid had no one to help him in the pool. Nobody in the pool could help him. They were worried about themselves first. But, but we know, as Dave preached a little while ago, we ought not think more highly of ourselves than we should. Then serve. Get in somewhere. Let people see what joy and wholeness looks like in you. Let that be your testimony. Jesus has filled me with joy, and I'm going to pass it on. You know why this pool was stagnant and stinky? Because water came in, but nothing came out. Why is the Dead Sea dead? Because it it's fed from the river of life, Jordan. But nothing ever leaves, and so it's dead. Wake up and come alive. Pick up your mat. But this won't be possible, man, unless you move out of where you're comfortable at. The last thing he said, and this was the hardest, right, was walk. He told him to walk. And this wasn't hard because he'd been sick for so long, because immediately he was made whole, right? The atrophy was gone. He was good to go. This was the hardest for him. Because that place he was at was all he'd ever known for 38 years. He had become comfortable in dysfunction. He had become comfortable with being dead, but alive. It was tough. Jesus said walk. And the context and the construct of what he's saying here, it's not walk like you see in a therapy place. You know, where it gets up, uh, it takes the first few baby steps. No, it's get up and walk out of here. Get out of this place. Why would you say that? Well, Jesus knew that the really sick people weren't in there. They were outside of there. Anybody ever heard the phrase, uh, pagan Persian? I just discovered it. But uh, evidently, it's a phrase that describes the statistical fact that within two years, the average person loses all contact of anybody who is not in their church. Anybody who was their friend before they were a believer. Taking person. And, and, and some people will use Second Corinthians 6.14. To, to kind of justify this, uh, to not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? 
And, and, and they think, oh, I, I'm not going to have fellowship with them. They're dark and I'm light. Look, Paul was talking about their values and their belief system. Because Jesus said this, no one hides a, a lamp under a basket. And he said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. <laughs> Look, the really sick people aren't in this church. But we got to break outside this bubble and tell people ab- about this hope that we have. Do you know how I uh, ended up in Iowa? I wasn't fleeing from the law, as some people have greatly exaggerated about. I was um, I was teaching at a Bible college uh, in Maryland, and um, I was an adjunct professor, which meant I taught at night. I taught Greek, and um, all my students were were pastors, and they were looking to get uh, licensed because the college had a uh, had a presbytery there that would license or, or give people credentials. And um, I, I ran a recovery ministry at, at our church, so I helped run it. But um, out of 900 people, uh, five confessed to having some sort of issue. And about 800 others were in denial. Um, <laughs> the people that I worked with, because I was still running my company, well, they'd all gotten saved way before that. And... Uh, I was, I was in a bubble. I was in a Christian bubble. And, and there was something not right. I wasn't feeling it. And God had been nudging me. Man, you need to break out of this bubble, Billy. He was actually told him. You need to break out of this bubble. And uh, I'm always like suspect when the Lord is telling me something because I don't know if it's me or, or him sometimes. One day, hopefully while I'm still alive, I'll find out to discern the difference. But uh, one of my students, Greg, had planted a church outside of uh, outside of Stevensville, Maryland. They kept asking me to come, asking me to come, and so finally, Kat and Patrick and I went there. Now, it was a Pentecostal church, and aside from one other person, we were the only white people there. Um, and it got a little bit crazy. They got a little bit off the chain in there. But at the end... Pastor Greg said that uh, Bill, come up here, man. God, I wanna, I wanna pray for you. And I was like, all right, and he got his elders around, and um, Pat and I were up there, and he said this: um, the Lord is telling me that you ain't right. Um, you're in a bubble. You need to get out. You need to pastor. You need to be with unbelievers. Everything that, that the Lord was telling me, he did. Maybe part of the reason I didn't know that it was the Lord telling me was because I was comfortable. Right? I was, people called me professor. You know, and not like the geeky, like, Billy Gonzalez professor either. You know, it was legit, sincere. I mean, you know, that was cool. Uh, I was involved with, with the church, but comfortable ain't always good. And look, I'm talking to somebody. I'm preaching to somebody here today. You're in a comfortable spot, and Jesus is saying, walk. Break out of that bubble. Because people won't hear it unless you tell them. And you won't even see them unless you get out of that bubble. Jesus said, walk. But I, I wrap this up. Um, the band's going to come up and, and play something. And as they do, I want you to meditate on, on, on these three things. And they're your next steps. Do you stand up for his values? For, for what you know is right? Or do you let people you work with, the people you hang with, Dictate that. Look, we got to stand. That, that's verse. Do people even know your story? Or are you afraid that that, that will come across as weakness? Who needs to hear it? Is your comfortable like you have right now? 
you are true, Lord. Are you walking? Are you busting out of the bubble? Because that's Jesus' word to all of us. And maybe there's this. Maybe your next step is the first step. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, look, the living water has come to the house. Right? He is here. Man, if you want to know Jesus Christ today, I'm going to be right over here. Just come on up. And, uh, and we'll make this transaction done. All right, so band, come on up and play. And we're going to worship the Lord. Feel free to use the altars. God is speaking to you. Come up and do business with the Lord.